Okay, today we're going to talk about what are called the three questions of economics. And these types of questions are very much philosophical questions. Um, it's important you understand that nobody tries to answer them. Um, they don't, you know, sit a president or a prime minister down on their first day in office and say, okay, you know, what do you plan to do with the three, uh, you know, the three questions of economics? I think more what you need to think of these questions as is they get to the heart of what we're trying to study, which is the big economic problem of scarcity. I've said that once or twice, right? So here's our three questions, and I think you've probably read about them in the book already, but let's just go over them. So our three questions, what shall we produce? Okay. How shall we produce whatever it is we're going to produce, the answer to this first question. And then once it's produced, who's going to get it? Who's going to uh, share in that? And we'll take a look at each of these with a little bit more depth. So the first question, what should we produce? Well, essentially, that's going to be answered by what you have available. So if you're a country with a lot of oil underneath you, well, you can produce oil. Do you have to? No. But if you don't have any oil at all, it's going to be very hard to produce that, obviously. So we think about things such as climate, um, you know, uh, geography, do you have lots of available coastline, do you have, um, you know, big natural bays where you can build ports and things like that relatively easily. Um, maybe you're a beautiful country and people really want to come see what you have to offer, uh, tourism and things like that. So the number one question here is just about, well, what's there and what's available? Um, and again, the reverse of that is also true. If you don't have something available, it's very unlikely that you're going to try to produce that. But maybe you can. So that's where trade comes in. If we look at um, the ability to trade, to trade for natural resources, you can actually make products that you don't really have good natural resources for. An obvious example here is Japan. Uh, they don't have a lot of the materials you need to build cars, yet obviously they build a lot of cars. So the resource endowment is very important, what you have available, but you can trade for some of those things. Some countries, however, they're stuck. They can't do, they, they, can, they don't have natural resources available, nor can they trade for them. Japan is able to trade for uh, uh, metal, for example, uh, iron ore, whatever they make their cars out of. They can trade for that, because they have, you know, we talked about the other day, they have a highly skilled workforce that's able to produce items of high value. Therefore, they can trade those items to somebody else, and, you know, with the profit from that, they can continue to buy what they need to make cars with. Many countries in Africa don't have that ability. They don't have anything readily available for them, nor, nor can they produce anything of any high value to trade for raw materials to make things of high value. So we call that a natural resource trap. Um, unit four, uh, there's, there's four big units in economics. The fourth unit is about economic development, and this is a major thing that we'll talk about when we get there. Won't be up for a long time, second semester of your second year, but I will bring these kind of things up from time to time and say, hey, this is something we need to be aware of really all the time. So. There's one other type of natural resource trap, and that's when you have a natural resource that um, people really want to exploit or take advantage of. Um, Southern Africa is a good example of that with the diamonds and the gold that's available in this region. So if you have something like that that people really, really want, that might be bad too, because they might come in and take it, then you don't get to really use the value of that natural resource to trade and get things that are beneficial to your country. Okay, the second question is, how should we produce it? And this gets to a big um, issue in economics, which is, how do we allocate resources? This is a word, if you don't know it, you probably need to go tattoo it somewhere, because we're going to use it all, all the time. When we allocate something, we're simply saying, how do we spread things out? How do we divide things up? Um, basically, how do we use things to their best um, advantage? So looking back at the example we've done a few times with, you know, different workers and they're, they're good at different jobs, good allocation of resources is saying, hey, this person is good at digging ditches or swimming laps, so we're going to have them do that. This person is better at this other activity, so we're going to have them do that. So that's what we mean when we talk about allocating resources. 
So how shall we produce it? It gets to this question of what's the best way we can take what we have, the best way we can take our natural resources, our, our resource endowment, how can we use it best to our advantage? This brings up a major issue. Um, and it's something that we don't get into too much in IB, it being an international program. Um, you know, we try not to take any sides. But different countries in the world deal with this question very differently from each other. So the question is, first of all, should the, bu should the public, and by public we mean government, um, those words are pretty much always synonymous in economics, should the public figure out how to best divide things up? Or should it be done pri uh, privately through the market? So privately through the market means, well, you know, right now we really have a desire for, um, I don't know, people, uh, carpenters. Uh, we need people who can build houses. So because we really need that, oh, I've got a better example. Do you guys know, uh, do you know Uber, right, the, uh, the taxi company? Um, if you're, it, I think it just came to South Africa, it just came to Johannesburg. Uh, but basically, it's um, you know it's people in their own cars, and they just show up and give you a ride, and and, and you pay them for that um, electronically. Well, they have this thing called surge pricing, which means if there's a lot of people who are on the Uber app and are looking for a ride, the price is going to go up. It's our classic supply and demand scenario. So that's privately them figuring out what it's going to be. Privately, they're going, okay, lots of people want this thing right now, so the price is higher. So if you want me to allocate my resource to taking you on a ride, you have to pay me more. Publicly, it would be, well, here's a flat price, here's what it costs, and that's it. Okay. So, again, this is a major source of disagreement. Lots of people really disagree about how this is best done, how it should be done, and uh, it's something that we'll continue to revisit throughout the course. Okay, the last question um, is kind of similar to the previous question in that it's very philosophical. Uh, the first question, obviously, it's not very philosophical. We either have a resource or we don't. Um, we can either trade for it or we can't, but there's not a whole lot of you know discussion to be had about it. The third question, for whom shall we produce? This gets to this idea of, well, who is it that benefits, who is going to benefit from the production of a given resource, or a given, I'm sorry, not resource, a given product. When we think about that, a common term that we use all the time in economics is cost and benefit. If I incur a cost, then I ought to benefit. So if I'm the person who, you know, paid to hire workers, if I'm the person who bought the land for the factory to be on, I'm the person who paid the electric bill for the factory to run, well, since I incurred a lot of cost, I ought to get a lot of benefit. The problem with that is, is the factory owner, or I'm sorry, the factory might be causing costs that the factory owner isn't seeing. This is a classic problem we look at in economics. So for example, maybe the factory generates pollution, which causes health problems in the surrounding area. Well, the cost of those health problems are a cost of the production. So since, you know, I'm a person who lives nearby and I develop a certain illness and have to go to the doctor, since I'm getting cost of that production, then I should benefit from the production as well. So that's essentially what we get at here. Um, so typically when we look at that, it brings up these issues of redistribution of wealth. So do we tax the rich more heavily? Um, do we tax production? Do we tax pollution? How is it that we make sure that everyone who is paying for something gets it? Or you can go the whole other way and say, well, just because you made it, just because you took on the risk, doesn't necessarily mean you should be the only one to benefit from it. Maybe, body, maybe everybody should benefit from it. So, anyway, that's that question, and again, that can be a very controversial uh, question, um, so it's something we'll talk about a lot. To wrap up, I think it's good to look at, um, we do this a lot in social studies, we kind of, you put two extremes, and then you kind of study how, you know, uh, examples fall in between those two extremes. Uh, it's called a continuum. You've probably heard that word before. So on the one end, we have where all the factors of production belong to everybody. Um, and again, this is not really a realistic um, uh, situation. Uh, even pure communism, like, uh, well, you would call it pure communism, but, you know, the countries that have tried communism in the past, they haven't gotten anywhere near this. 
the other end, the other extreme, would be where you have total privatization, um, which means that every factor of production belongs to just one person. Maybe in fraction, maybe, you know, you own half and I own half, but, you know, 100% of that is owned by an individual. Um, again, we would call that pure capitalism, and you don't really have that in a pure form either. Um, both of them are just sort of things that people might aspire to or might think is the better way to do it. When you look at countries and how they fall along that, uh, probably the best example or the closest example to uh, total privatization is the United States. But even in the U.S., there are many types of production that are done by the state, and they are produced for lots of different people, not just for individuals. So public education, uh, things like roads and bridges, um, infrastructure type things, uh, defense, military, police, all that is done to the benefit of everybody. So that really is something that takes, it's, it's not total privatization, you don't have, you know, I don't go pay a single police officer to protect me, I don't pay to go on a road every time I use a road, so it's not total privatization, so the U.S. isn't all the way over here, not even close. When you look in Europe, um, probably the country that is furthest this way would be the United Kingdom, and they're not as far that way as the U.S. is, perhaps. Uh, the U.K. has, um, it has public education goes beyond high school, and I think it has some forms of uh, public health care as well. Probably the furthest left in Europe would be, um, and by the way, left and right there, I don't mean left and right the way that you might hear them before, I just mean left side, right side. So further towards uh, all factors of production belonging to everybody would be a country like Sweden. They're pretty well known for, you know, full public health care, uh, education, like, is all paid for by the state. They have very generous policies for um, people who are out of work, people who can't work because of disabilities. I think famously there, even fathers, new fathers, get like two years off to uh, spend with their new kid and all that, which uh, that's, that's a lot. Um, so that's that. When you look at countries that are closer to this side, there's really not a lot of good examples. Maybe we would have said 25 years ago that China or the USSR um, Eastern Europe. Maybe we would have said that they were over there, uh, but most of those countries aren't claiming to be communist anymore. They claim to be capitalist. Um, and even China today, who claims to be a communist country, they're really not. Um, they've moved very much to the right, and you know, much of what they do is very capitalist in nature. Things maybe technically are still done by the state, but they're done in such a capitalist fashion that it's hard to argue that. Okay, one more issue then is a country like, like South Africa, where we live, well, where we soon all will live. Um, so South Africa, it's probably pretty far over, over to this side, you know, kind of like the U.S., and if you look around, most things in South Africa are privatized. But, that being said, there's such a large section of the economy that doesn't really, it, it's so informal, you, it's not, income isn't reported perhaps, sales aren't reported, probably not paying tax, that it's hard to classify it strictly this way just because of the nature of how things are there.